scat. Dan! Hey, how are you, James? Good. Doing really well. So thank you so much for uh, joining us today on the stream. No worries. I love the uh, love the show so far. Excellent. And and also thank you very much for donating a copy of your upcoming game Gold Rush, which is people are very excited about. My pleasure. So, I know you are you're you're a programmer from way back in the day uh and worked with Activision in the 80s, which is incredible um because they were they were they are known as like the the company that put out the best games for the Atari 2600 um, and some of your games I actually played in the 80s <laughs> which is crazy um, as a kid I uh, crackpots I, I played that a whole bunch my friend had crackpots and it was such fun you also uh, made Ghostbusters Kung Fu Master F14 Tomcat Crossbow River Raid 2 Double Dragon and Akari Warriors is uh, your resume for uh, the 2600, and now you're back making a new game, uh, Gold Rush, and uh, also another one, Bon Voyage, after that. Yes, yep, uh, Gold Rush, I think everyone has seen the video uh, of the train cars. Um, it's coming along quite well. I've got all the objects and enemies now coded, and uh, just doing some cleaning up of the code, and going to be focusing on audio soon. Uh, and then start laying out the many levels that will be comprised of all those different train cars. Oh, I see. Like, um, you've got all the elements, and now you're putting them in order, and I guess, would the would the earlier levels have less train cars? This is what I hypothesized, I think, on an earlier show. Like, the early levels would have a certain number, say five or seven train cars, and then, then it would get longer and longer as, as you progress through the levels? Correct. And, uh, and many of the cars you can actually climb into. And there's there's screens inside the cars, um, for a bunch of the box cars, the coach cars, dining cars, and you can you can get into them via these little hatches that are on top. And also, I think you mentioned once somewhere, just like Pitfall, you can go from car to car while you're inside the cars as well as when you're on top. Correct. It's got the same type of uh, two level play that Dave put into Pitfall. Um, and some of the cars actually are, there's a, a number of cars by, uh, by the great Radini that are being pulled by the, by the Gold Rush Gulch Railroad. And those are magic cars and they actually do some pretty, pretty unique things besides just going from one car to another. They actually will add some other level of gameplay. Ah, so it won't be as straightforward as people think. It's not. It's going to go outside of the realism type of realm and get into some uh, some magic. Then it will. It'll, it'll get into a little bit of fantasy in some of the cars, uh, and the circus cars will have some animals that you'll have to deal with. And um, there's there's going to be quite a lot of things I'm putting in there to uh, to really spice up the gameplay. So so for people who maybe don't know the 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 history of how this how this game evolved and how it came about and maybe you can give a quick rundown of of the origins uh, of gold rush and um and now how it's come to this point oh sure um i started uh, this game as keystone capers 2 um soon after i finished crackpots at, at activision uh gary had finished keystone capers a little bit ahead of me which did very well um, I had finished uh, 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 Crackpots, and he was on to his, his next title, um, which I think he was playing around with uh, Pressure Cooker. And uh, we started talking in the lab one day about, you know, Keystone's done so well, it'd be nice to do a sequel. And being a fan of trains, I've always tried to replicate some train cars on the Stella display. And I thought, that would be kind of cute to put Keystone Kelly up there. And so I created the prototype, put Keystone Kelly on board. And that was about October-ish, November. The video game crash was in full swing. Um, Vision pulled us off. The, the 2600 games put us on other, other games for some of the emerging platforms of the time. And uh, I made a ROM. I remember bringing it home back then and lost track of it. 
And I had uh, frequently visited the classic game, gaming convention, the E3s, the CESs throughout the years, and would meet up with John Hardy and Joe and Sean over at the National Video Game Museum. They always had an exhibit there. Uh, usually a very cool retro 1980s bedroom where they had an a, a Nintendo, I'm sorry, uh, an Atari set up uh, and in television. And I would always joke around and say, you know, I have this game with Keystone Keepers 2 that I never finished. And after about the 15th or 16th year of saying this, they kind of looked at me at one point and said, oh, we kind of think you're full of shit. Um, and then it, the joke was, oh, Dan's got this game we're never going to see. Well, last year, um, uh, uh, Carolyn, my, my lovely significant other, whom you've met, and I were going through uh, my off-site storage and looking for some things. And lo and behold, I see a box back there, and she starts rummaging through it. And I said, oh, one of these days I'm going to find that cartridge that, that, I found, that I had. And she started pulling out things and saying, is this it? Is this it? Nope. And she pulled out this little red case and said, is this it? And I said, oh, my God, that's Keystone Capers 2. And I was so excited. I got on the phone outside of the storage area with John Hardy, the, um, the curator of the National Video Game Museum. John happened to be in Long Island visiting his, uh, his mother at the time. And he said, well, you have this thing. I'm going to come over tomorrow, drive from Long Island to New Jersey, and see if it works. He did. I had a Stella unit set up. We plugged it in, and it lit right up. And, oh, my God, I was taken back. The funny thing was my brother Gary and I were talking about two or three months earlier about the resurgence of interest in the 2600 and homebrews. And he showed me uh, a uh, – it was a uh, an online uh, Stella tool, um, and – and I started playing around with it. This is two or three months before I found the cartridge. And I said to Caroline, I said, you know, I, I had this cartridge of Keystone Capers 2 that I think I'll never find. I want to start recreating it for my memory. And I was about three months into playing with it, setting up the train cars, the background. And then she finds the cartridge. And lo and behold, it's amazing how close my memory was to the actual game. Um, I think, in fact, the newer version I was writing was better looking than the original. Uh, and so I found it. Uh, I donated it ultimately to John uh, and the folks at the National Video Game Museum. Uh, and I decided then to, to take the game and take the code I had started three months earlier, um, which had no affiliation with Activision. Um, I didn't want to use their code. It's, it's, I have no rights to do that. Uh, I'm concerned about their, their intellectual property rights. And I, I started to rewrite it. And uh, just before the retro, uh, the Portland Retro Gaming Expo last year, where you and I met, um, we were trying to think of a name and went through a bunch of things. And Carolyn said, well, you know, it's a gold, you have gold bars on the train and you're rushing around getting them. Not a gold rush, because that's also an old Western term. And it really fit perfectly. And so the game will be released as Gold Rush, um, ultimately. And I will pay homage to Keystone Capers in some of the, the uh, coach cars. We'll run into some of the Activision characters that we, we love very much. Tim Paul Harry will be visiting. Frostbite uh, visiting. Uh, Frostbite Bailey, I think it is. Um, and, uh, and Keystone Kelly may come west and visit his cousin, uh, Casey O'Kelly, uh, on the railroad. That's very, very exciting. Um, so, so it was cutting out a bit there. So you said it's going to be released in uh, October? I, I'm, I'm actually, yes, hoping to get it released in October. I For the Portland Retro Gaming Expo and, and well, line all that up? It's going to be the first playable will be on Zero Page, as we talked about. Dude, thank you. Thank you so much. That's excellent. I, I want can't to try to get into the game and try to try to get the high score, the first high score. Yeah, I, I joked. I joked when we played Galaga on the stream that I have the world record in Galaga for sure. twenty six hundred. When I for now, for just the for now, yeah. very good. Yes, it's always to have that first world record. Uh, 
And, and I'm hoping the first manufactured cartridge will be the one that I saw and which is, is uh, given to, to, to the lucky winner of the eBay uh, auction. auction. Yes, of course. That's very exciting that, um, that we have a copy, future copy, <laughs> of, of Gold Rush, a promised copy of Gold Rush, um, up for auction to support Stella. And, um, and you, were, you were mentioning Stella um, uh, in your story. And are you, are you uh, using that right now uh, for your development of... Uh Absolutely. Uh, I started using Stella just last year, and I was amazed at the amount of detail they put into it to replicate even the slightest technical nuance that we used to deal with on the 2600 in the old days. Um, you know, back when we started, when I started Activision, Bob Whitehead had taken... Uh, two or three boards, put them in a little blue box, and had written his own monitor so that it could communicate with our PDP-11 where we did, we did our software, uh, which was the size of a room with an air conditioning unit. Um, and we joked that it was so slow you could hit um, assemble and go out to lunch and then come back and it may be done with your, with your 4K assembly. Oh, brutal! Oh my God! <laughs> but we would. So this uh, is like this is like night and day now that you can uh, night and day. program it and and look at it and do breakpoints and analyze what's going on in RAM and and completely visualize it as like in real time, correct? And uh, what we had was a Stella unit that was modified sitting on top of the blue box, and it ran off of two or four K of RAM inside the box, um, and so. Every time we developed uh, and we made changes, obviously we'd have to assemble. We'd have to download it into the blue box, which we connected, I believe it was a VT100 uh, airline terminal at the time to communicate with the blue box. And we could do very basic things. Bob wrote a great monitor, uh, single step breakpoints. Um, we also had a logic analyzer that we could pull over on a cart and uh, put on top of the 6502 and that had a little display on it so we could actually see what everything what happened was what was happening on all the address lines data lines um if we had a real bugger a real bug of a bugger that to solve but uh stella is amazing how it has revolutionized development it's wonderful there are even little tricks that i did with timing on the 2600 back in the 80s that for fun i wanted to see if they captured it they grabbed the TIA and the timing so well that it's like with an actual unit. Yeah, it it is really amazing the minutia that they've gotten down to um, um, for in in Stella. Can you stay in a empty room and stop pressing the button because it's actually cutting him out. Oh shit! Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Sorry. Yeah, it it is un unbelievable um, how much work over the decades. Of course, they've had decades to work on it, but. Um, yeah, the developers working hand in hand with the Stella team to replicate every like even bugs and things that weren't supposed to happen because some people exploit those those things, those uh, illegal opcodes and things like that to make to make games work differently. Right. Yes, the timing specifically uh, is is to the to to the cycle, which is uh, wonderful. I mean, we had back in the old days. Some of the Stellas weren't exactly perfect. They were all pretty good. But we had an instance where we had a few of the older units that weren't exactly running the software. If we were pushing the, the, um, uh, pushing the cycles to the max and doing some loads and stores at really delicate places. Um, for instance, I do in, in Gold Rush, I have eight, tire, eight wheels on the bottom of the train. And those are done literally by by hammering the, the reset player across the screen to continually position players that are new and the timing is just right so they fit perfectly with the play field above it which acts as the trucks if anyone knows what a truck is on a on a box car it's the little metal that keeps the two two uh, wheels together and connect to the bottom of the box car uh, and that timing works really well on Stella and it's worked well on every so every unit that I've burned a ROM and tried it on. Um, it does not work well on the um, 
at Games Portable 2600. I don't, I don't think they're running Stella or the latest version. No, and that's a lot of people have made patches for old games so that they work on the those those at games consoles. I, I definitely would not compromise anything in a game to make it work on that system. Agreed. If Agreed. it if if you can make it without changing something, like oh, there's a little code that you can change, but the, I would definitely do that. But I would not compromise anything in a in a game to to just cater to that very small you know, niche audience, and unless it was going to be packaged with it or some some sort of deal that you've made with that games, because, um, I mean, the Retron 77 was put out with a number of homebrew games included on it, so of course it had to work with uh, the old version of Stella that's included on it, so that, that would be the only reason I could think that you would want to make sure it runs on an old Stella. Um, we have some uh, questions from the crowd, yep. which please, yep. if anybody has questions for Dan Kitchen, please go ahead. Um, uh, RJ Edwards 70 says, can you tell us a bit more about the three patches that we'll, ab we'll be able to earn on uh, Gold Rush? So maybe what what kind of achievements? Are they score achievements? Are they level achievements? Uh, they'll be score. Um, and it's, um, it's, it's three levels. The, uh, the first will be conductor. Uh, I haven't yet worked out the score plateaus. That will do with playtesting, which I would be flattered if you and Arlen would help the playtesting of that. Uh, oh, we would I'll love do in a heartbeat. To oh, yes. I, just I would like, love that. Yeah, we'll, now, we'll definitely this, put it through. Yeah, that'll be, it'll be a lot of fun. Um, and then we'll have engineer, or actually, it'll be conductor, uh, it, it'll be baggage man, and it'll be engineer. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. A graduated uh, level. Tanya's out in the hallway. She's, I am. <laughs> she's scared to come in. You should come in so we can see you. I, I, I'm going to have to kneel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's okay. You'll come and I make a bit of room that? here. I don't even know where that... There it is. Oh, I, we're using that camera. <laughs> Squish. So, um, let's see. What other questions? And can you give some comments on how you feel about the new capabilities brought about by co-processors on the cart? such as ARM chips, does it still feel like an Atari, for example, when you look at a sophisticated new game like Galaga? That's from Andrew Davey. And I know you are, are, are focusing on this, on your two new games, keeping it to the uh, no coprocessors, keeping it to something that could have been made in the 80s and 90s with the original run of the Atari. Yes, um, I am. I'm, I'm keeping it purely 6502. Um, Gold Rush will be 32K, uh, eight banks of, of 4096. And I, uh, I'm i a purist in that way, but I'm all for the sophistication and the new technology. I mean, we had it back then when Dave designed his DPC uh, chip, which uh, some believe stands for display processor chip, but I know it actually stood for David Patrick Crane. Um, of course, uh, too much of a coincidence. That Dave, Dave is just a god when it comes to the system and to engineering in, in, in everything he does. So even back then, we were trying to find other hardware to push the limits. So I think what we've done is incredible. Uh, what John has done, I'm stupefied by. The, the work he has done on Galaga, I didn't think was possible. Um, Mappy itself is amazing. Scramble was amazing. But Galaga is, I mean, it is a arcade machine jammed into a... 2600. Uh, it is incredible, and I'm all for people using that technology because it'll just make the games better and better. Um, I'm just uh, going back to the purist because that's where I came from, and I always enjoyed the, the restrictions given to me by the 2600. That made the machine the most fun of any machine I wrote code on. And, and sometimes having these restrictions um, challenges yourself to get the best out of of what is given to you and sometimes results in something even better than maybe if you're given a multitude of tools to go here here's a bunch of things um and and maybe it, it brings out the best in you by by giving a bit of a challenge agreed uh, i know that back in the day we used to uh um we here, let me turn this light off and make things better there we go 
day, we would we would often write games for consumers, but also for other designers. Uh, many times we wrote games um, just to show off what we could do. And I remember a lot of CESs, we would have some of the other designers walk over and we'd go over to Bob and look at his screen and say, uh, Bob, how the hell did you do that? And then we'd have to figure out how it was done. Um, some of the competitors did that as well. I remember one CES where um, my friend Ed Salvo from Games by Apollo uh, came over at one point, and I think it was uh, it was the V-Delay, V-Del registers, which I think are 2A or 2B, something like that. And he came over and said, hey, this is really nice. How do you guys do this? And I said, well, I can't tell you, Ed. You're a competitor. He said, yeah, but can you just tell me what this register does? <laughs> it's like, Ed, I can't tell you. Um, but we, we did things like that in a way like John is doing for others in the, in, in the arena of, of developers to look at and say, wow, how the hell did you do that? And I actually asked him online about something he did in Gallica. And when he explained it to me, I was like, yeah, I get that. But incredible what a talented chap like he can do with extra hardware. And probably I'd love to see what he would do without the hardware. He'd probably de design rings around us. Um, and it's just, uh, I think the hardware is great. I think it, it makes the machine that's 40 years old last longer and longer. Well, if you want a really good example of, of uh, John Champeau's work without the, the chip, you can take a look at Ladybug, which is a, yes. an incredible, yes. incredible port for the Atari that it, 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 it always deserved. And, and he just wanted to see it on the Atari. So he's, he's a skilled programmer no matter what tools you put no, in, in no. front of him. He's a man. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, he's, he's definitely got what it takes. And we would love to have had him 40 years ago. Um, Andrew Davies has a follow-up question. Um, he says, you're all for it, but can you see yourself using it in the future in a game? And have you ever programmed in C? I have programmed in C. Um, and I, I, I may, may do that. Um, once again, I just, you know, my, in my career, Activision was a magical time. Uh, we were at the forefront of making video games. Gary and I had actually had our own company previous to that where we did a number of Apple games that we, we did through various publishers and really wanted to join Activision, looked up to those guys. Um, in every game back then, they had the little catalog, and in the back of the catalog, they had the four pictures of the guys, uh, Bob Whitehead, Al Miller, Larry Kaplan, and Dave Crane. And at one point in our little lab office in, in his basement, we drew our own pictures, myself, Gary, a guy, Kevin, who was working with us, and a guy, John. And we stuck them over that on the catalog. We pinned it up on the wall and said, we're going to be those guys one day. And eventually, we were blessed enough to actually be hired by Activision, open their Eastern Design Center. And it was a very magical time for, for all of us. And the challenge of working on that machine was so much fun that I, I actually get to relive those days as I write code now. Um, so I would probably prefer not to use C and not to use some of the extra, but you know, who knows? It's I'm finishing Gold Rush, uh, Bon Voyage. I've got a, a very nice screen up for it. And um, uh, I'm, I'm working on that. Who knows? Maybe the third game after that, I think I may, I may look at some of the pro co-processors that are floating around. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, it does make the card a little more expensive and, and to make the carts very affordable uh, to everyone who wants to buy one. Um, so that's another consideration. It's no longer as easy as it was then to manufacture. As you know, Al has helped everyone on that regard. In a lot of cases, people are taking old DPC chips and soldering them out of the old boards to use them. Um, it's much easier if you're, only, if you're ROM only. Uh, in my case, there, I'm working with someone to design a new board, and I've got a new uh, uh, a house in China who's making the new cartridge cases, and so we, we are kind of going from scratch that way. Uh, it may be harder once we add extra hardware involved.
Yeah, uh, Andrew Davies says, I was also a 1980s programmer. I look back on those days with great fondness and feel very fortunate too. But if I look at the details of the work back then, it was incredibly long hours and stressful. I wouldn't do it again, but it's the people I remember, still good friends with many. Dan, was it stressful for you too? And would you do... Would you do that sort of work today? Well, you are making games again today, so you know, is, is it you stressful? Know, you're you're kind of taking more laid. Back. I am. Um, I have continued to stay in the video game business since uh, Activision. Um, when I when we left Activision, Gary and I formed a company called Imagineering, which ultimately became Absolute Entertainment, where we did uh, we took the, the company public. We were in business for nine years. We did a lot of games. Back then, for the Super Nintendo, Nintendo Genesis. Um, and yes, we worked the long hours then in the 80s. I mean, I can remember never having a summer because I was always getting code ready to be manufactured for Christmas. Um, uh, we often would have the two or three day stints of staying up, writing code. Um, after Absolute, I had a small development company for five years where I did PC CD-ROM games. I did the same thing. Uh, and then I was fortunate enough to be hired by a company called Majesco that was based in New Jersey. And I helped launch them from a remanufacturer of Super Nintendo games to a full-fledged publisher and did the bulk of my work there. I think I produced there or either designed, produced, or wrote around 110 Game Boy games across Color, black and white, Game Boy Advance, Game Boy DS, um, and helped them with a number of console titles that people may know, Blood Rain, uh, Advent Rising. I worked with Tim Schafer on Psychonauts, um, did, uh, did Jaws uh, for, for Universal, did a lot of film company products, um, uh, Ghost Rider and, and Eon Flux and products like that. And we st and for the people who don't know, also you worked on Desert Bus, which is Penn and Teller's game, yeah, <laughs> which, which is the craziest game ever. Um, that where you're that, dr you're driving a bus from where is it, L.A. to? Uh, it's from Tucson, Arizona to Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, yeah, and uh, it's and it's just a straight road, but the steering's just a little bit wonky on the bus, so you have to pay attention and keep steering it a little bit off and it's like is it a six hour drive there it, and a six it, hour drive back and there's like one bug that hits the windshield yeah. and you have wipers <laughs> and and it's used for events like this for raising money and people play it for for they drive there you get one point and then you drive back and you get one more point it's it's absolutely brilliant and and, and i i love the I, and i believe uh uh, one of uh, Brian did a version for the 2600. Um, yes, uh, I don't know his screen name. I apologize. Um, but to, to finish with Andrew, yes, I, I still I, I do contract work now. I have a company in India where we do artwork for video game and for online games. Uh, I am diving into the 2600, and sometimes even with my contractual real job work of owning the studio and helping run it, we do have the crunch time. So um, I really haven't stopped doing that, but I can tell you as I get older, it's not as much fun and it is harder to, uh, to stay up two or three days. Uh, uh, but yeah, I, can but I, I have paid friends who's young, young chaps who say, well, you know, what's the game business? It must be great. It is great, but you will put in some long, hard hours. And I know that's a very big issue now with the crunch time uh, and the talk around the GDC for years of unionize and, and whatnot. And I, I, am, I am certain that a lot of these companies really burn their, their talent out and don't take care of them. Uh, one thing I always did is the, the value of my company walked in and out every day. Other than that, it was equipment. And we took care of the people who worked for us and the artists and the programmers and the producers, because they are the heartbeat and the blood of your company. And if you and that's and, and that's why Activision was initially set up is, is because was set up. Atari. Yeah. Yep. Atari yep. didn't uh, value its employees, its programmers more. I think the quote was more than the person who put the game in the box. That's correct. And we actually, 
when we met with them in 1982, we were at the Consumer Electronics Show. Gary had just shipped Space Jockey after back engineering the 2600 at a firm that he and I worked at. And we met with Activision. We met with Atari at that show. And, and they wanted to fly us out to uh, potentially be hired. And I remember we came back to New Jersey. And a week or so later, we, we were wined and dined in first class and went to Atari for a big interview and came back to New Jersey. And the next week, wined and dined in first class and went to Activision. And Atari, I literally had a VP of product development look at us and say, you know, I can get towel designers to do the kind of work you guys do. Just tell. That was a, that's a real quote. You could just tell that they didn't care about the talent or the people. They just wanted you to make a product that they could sell, and they weren't concerned about your ability to be creative. Wow. That's, that's terrible. That's terrible. It was and so I can I can totally see why um, those the the first initial people uh, left uh, Atari and, and formed Activision and um, and went on to a huge success. Oh yeah, because Bob, you, yeah. Bob, if you don't Bob, treat them right, they're going to walk out the door and take their time. Bob and Dave and Al and, and Larry just couldn't do it anymore, and just wanted to go off. And they ended up meeting a wonderful man, Jim Levy, who was a businessman who could raise capital, and with them. Uh, Jim was went on a road show and raised capital and, and started Activision in a, in a little office in Santa Clara, and the rest is history. Well, I, I want to thank you so much for joining us today, and, and I want to thank you so much for uh, donating your game Gold Rush to um, the Stellathon to help raise money to continue on with this great tool and emulator that we have that we can all enjoy for free. And it's open source. Everybody can contribute to it. So, and we're um, honored to get to play test it on the show. That's insane. Yes. Thank yeah, you so much. So honored no to be the first I think, to play Gold I think Rush. Shelly is amazing. I think we wouldn't be where we are in the homebrew community without it. We'd really be lost without a proper tool. Um, we'd all be, you know, the Harmony card is wonderful. I'm, I'm sad it doesn't work in my Retron 77. Um, but it's a great device, and I love using it plugging into real Stella units, but I think we we would all be lost without the Stella emulator. And it's just incredible how wonderful they've they've made it and how it's a, an asset for all of us. And I am personally uh, so excited to see the machine still going strong after 40 years and the interest in it. Um, I thought I may have been the only one who still had fun. <laughs> no, it's a great, great community, I, and I'm really happy to be I was amazed to find out how wonderful people have, have done, how many wonderful games people have done over the last, you know, 10 years, 20 years. Um, incredible. I, I'm sad I wasn't a part of it then, but very happy to be on board now and, and help uh, continue to make uh, great products. Yeah, definitely. And I'm, I'm sure everybody out there is looking forward to your, your return to the Atari 2600. I promise and, I'm not and, disappoint. I'm not disappoint. <laughs> oh, it, uh, I know you won't. Like everybody's seen the screenshots already, and that amazing graphic of the train engine, which just blows me away. That huge train engine with the moving wheels and everything's bumping is just unbelievable. So I can't wait to to get uh, to get my hands on a joystick on it. Uh, that will be soon, and and uh, we'll uh, we'll we'll coordinate with you offline on that. Definitely. So thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we will talk with you soon, Dan. Great. Definitely. Bye, Arlen. Bye, Tanya. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>